and welcome to the conclusion of our look at the 30th anniversary of the 1989 Batman movie. Oh well, let's pick up right where we left off. Alfred kind of chewing Bruce out. So this is where they learn of Bruce's tragic backstory and that his parents were murdered in the alley. The mayor announces that the 200th anniversary gala has been indefinitely postponed because they can't guarantee any public safety, but that's when they're interrupted by the Kool-Aid Man. Oh yeah! Nah, I'm only joking. It's the Joker. So the Joker takes over the mayor's transmission <clears throat> as he announces his intentions for the 200th anniversary festival, which he insists on going on as scheduled. There will be yes, with the additional guarantee that Batman should be there. The man who has brought real terror. This actually leads into what I think is my favorite music cue on the Danny Elfman soundtrack, Childhood Remembered. And you might remember that I used it in my Batman Death in the Family video. Yes, of course I gave credit to Danny Elfman. What you might not know about this scene is that Adam West was hoping to play the role of Thomas Wayne here in this flashback sequence. But of course, Peter Goober and John Peters, and I think also Tim Burton, wanted this to be as far away from the campy Batman as possible. So, no Adam West. Also in keeping with continuity, the, paint, the portrait we see on Wayne's wall earlier of his father is that same actor there. So good continuity there. This also leads to another big bone of contention, of course, and that was having Jack Napier, a.k.a. the Joker, be the guy who murdered Bruce Wayne's parents. Yes, I know that was a big nitpick among hardcore fans, but, you know, to tell you the truth, it really doesn't matter. I mean, who gives a shit about Joe Chill, right? And for all we know, Joe Chill might have been one of those guys there. This was another nitpick among the fans. Alfred just letting Vicky Vale into the Batcave. To which Sam Hamm, who actually was one of the writers on this film, said, I agree with you, that should be Alfred's last day of employment at Wayne Manor. But in all honesty, she would have found out anyway, come on. And as one reviewer pointed out, there are a lot of cornball, over-the-top talks in The Dark Knight that are really pretentious and silly-sounding, but in this Batman movie, there's really only one talk about why Batman does what he does, and it does sound very much the way normal people would talk. So yeah, kudos for that. So now it's time to suit up for the final confrontation. But first, it's back to the place where it all began, as the Joker's men are waiting for Bats at Axis Chemical. Jeez, I hope nobody important was at Axis Chemical. Otherwise, Batman is a psychopathic murderer. Oh yes, there's another Prince song in here as well, called Trust. Again, I feel that adding pop music to a, to a movie really does date the film significantly. You know, much like my same complaint with the art museum scene. But I think, really, the addition of Prince music in this movie, I believe, was Tim Burton's idea since he had gone to see a Prince concert while they were shooting. So, as Vicky takes pictures of the festival, that's when she realizes the balloons are releasing the Smilex gas that'll kill everybody. You see, initially, Alexander Knox was actually supposed to die in the film, but... Don't worry, kids. Alexander Knox is allowed to live. I guess because Goober, Burton, and also Peters liked him so much, they let him live. Not that it matters, he wouldn't even be in the sequel. So Batman basically presses a button on the Batwing, and well, uh, <clears throat> that takes care of them as he snatches up all the balloons. Which I think leads to one of the Joker's classic lines here. So Bats releases the balloons and, eh, let Metropolis deal with it. So the Joker's so pissed he ends up shooting Bob, his right-hand man and number one guy. And we get this nice little moment. 
Well, as you can gather, he's a little pissed that Batman stole his balloons, so he just eggs him on to shoot him. So Batman fires away with everything he's got, but still somehow manages to miss the Joker. I have a theory that he deliberately missed, because <clears throat> Batman doesn't kill. Except in these movies. So the bat, jet, the bat Jet is taken out with a simple pop gun. Oh, by the way, in this scene where the Joker looks up at how high Gotham City Cathedral is and says, better make it 10 minutes. Better make it 10. Okay, 10 minutes. Everything that happens actually does happen in real time because this whole scene, from the time the Joker gives that order to the time they reach the top of the cathedral and the helicopter does come, it's all done in 10 minutes. I think it should also be noted that this cathedral scene was actually inspired by Phantom of the Opera. Let me just turn the volume down and I'll explain it. You see, both Jack Nicholson and producer John Peters had gone to see Phantom of the Opera while they were shooting in London. You know how I mentioned Tim Burton went to the Prince concert? Well, both Nicholson and Peters went to see Phantom of the Opera. So that's what inspired this uh, big climax here in Gotham City Cathedral. Now, as I was saying, this was all done in real time. So yes, there is a 10 minute gap between the time the Joker calls for Gotham City for transport from the cathedral to the time that the helicopter arrives. Now some of the Joker's ninja goons here, they're just damned hysterical. Like that guy, doing all these somersaults and flips until Batman stabs him, I guess. <laughs> That's gotta be the most accident-prone goon I've ever seen. So Batman knocks Ray Charles' head right into a bell, right before knocking him clearly down the cathedral. Vicky notices that Batman is nearby, obviously, so basically, well, she starts pretending to cozy up to the Joker, kinda, well, basically dummy him up, or trick him. Hey, you get your own damn catchphrase. Like I said, that smirk on his face, that's something only Keaton could pull off. And now you understand why I like Jack Nicholson's Joker a lot better than Ledger, because this is the Joker that has all the laughs, all at the same time while maintaining the frights. Well, maybe the Adam West Batman wouldn't. So the Joker's got Batman and Vicky Vale dead to rights on the cathedral top, as he tries dancing around just to knock their hands off. So the Joker's getaway copter arrives. However, Batman has an idea. He shoots his grappling line on the gargoyle, which caught him, which catches the Joker's foot. So yeah, this is not going to be a clean break, is it? And so the Joker falls to his death. Batman saves Vicky. And the police inspect the Joker's dead body on the ground. But Commissioner Gordon still hears some laughing. Ha! I knew he was a robot! Nah, it's just this little laughing bag in his jacket pocket. So now the police have the bat signal to contact him if they ever need his help again. And given that we're gonna get sequels, yeah, they're gonna need his help a lot. And that's that! Well, I hope you've enjoyed this and this look at the 1989 Batman movie with me. Here's to 30 awesome years of Tim Burton's Dark Knight-inspired Batman. I'll see you guys later.